So it's just after six o'clock. I think we should um, formally open this event. Um, my name is Sarah Helps and I'm the trust wide lead for systemic psychotherapy at the Tavistock. Um, and I um, am delighted to see so many people here for what's going to be a really enjoyable um, and thought provoking evening. Um, I'm delighted to welcome you all to this talk, which falls towards the end of the Tavistock Centenary Festival. In the festival, we've spent a year looking back at our roots and looking forward to where we might head in coming decades. The overall purpose of the Centenary series is to engage in dialogue um, with the wide range of conversational partners, um, to reflect on our beginnings, our roots, with a broad and diverse audience. In doing so, we've been particularly interested to consider issues of equality and diversity, both in relation to uh, the past and most importantly, in relation to how we go forward, um, particularly in a way that addresses individual and organizational blind spots and leads to a future with an inclusive and diverse workforce and a group of students and people who use our services. There's a circularity to this evening. Um, members of the systemic discipline, including Sarah Barrett, were due to give one of the first centenary talks last March. Um, it was cancelled at very short notice because of this thing that we're now calling the COVID-19 pandemic. And it seems very fitting to have this talk um, with Sarah and to others who I will introduce in a moment um, after what's been a very strange year. In thinking about um, not only this year, uh, but also the discipline of systemic psychotherapy at the Tavistock, um, the metaphor that springs to mind is not so much a lone tree that's grown through certain roots, but more a tangled, messy, interacting, rhizomic plant that gets tangled up with all sorts of other plants and grows and learns from all those other plants. We're in very interesting times um, when it seems that clinicians from many different core professions find systemic relational thinking and acting useful, um, both inside and outside of mental health and social care. So I'm delighted to welcome three women who in different ways have hugely influenced my journey and the journey of many of you on the screen and far beyond. Of course, there are many men and women who could have spoken and one of the joys of my role in leading the trust at the moment is following in the foots of so many great teachers, thinkers and practitioners. This evening we'll hear from Jill Goral Barnes, without whom we, we really wouldn't have such a good understanding of the diversity of family forms and the impact of separation and divorce. We'll hear from Jenny Altshuler, whose work with illness has powerfully shaped systemic practice in the field. And uh, we will hear from Sarah Barrett, um, who will be providing thoughtful, practical and grounding ideas about work with GPs and families and GP practices outside the clinic. In these talks, you'll hear from three women um, on the theme of inside and outside, being both inside our bodies and our families and our relationships and working inside the clinic and outside the clinic all developing the notion of the systemic practitioner as a fluid, flexible, interactive tool creatively facilitating the building of connections. After we've heard from Sarah, Jill and Jenny, we'll have a brief pause um, for a comfort break. And then after that, we'll go into a discussion um, facilitated uh, by Jill, Jenny and Sarah, me and Shona Grant, and Natalino Putsu. Uh, Shona and Natalino are two of the newest members of the clinical services um, at the Trust. They both trained um, at the Trust and are a great advert for how clinicians often come back in different ways throughout their careers. Just as we were getting ready for um, this talk, 
Jill reminded us that actually Jill, Sarah and Jenny had also all started off at the Tavistock Inn um, as, as trainees and students in some way. So there's a very nice symmetry happening. Um, so after we've had a, a discussion between us, uh, the chat will be open and there'll be lots of time for questions and discussion about what you've heard this evening. So without further delay, I will pass you over to Jill, who's going to start talking this evening. Jill, over to you. Hello, Sarah. Hello, everybody. That was um, what a lovely introduction. Thank you. Um, it's, it's a most extraordinary event, and I hope we can all do something with it together, not knowing who any of you are or what you really want. Um, obviously, it's quite perplexing. So Sarah, Sarah, Jenny and I decided to take a few themes out of a number of possible things that we could talk about, because it's almost as though not to talk about COVID, you know, would be like not talking about racism or sexism. Um, so we decided we'd focus on the idea of de what develops health in families uh, and how that's been thought about at the Tavistock. Uh, I'm starting as far as the 1970s, but I'm going to spend a little time on what happened before that. And of course, some people think I should have spent much more time on the earlier history and other people think I should have gone much more into the complexity of the later story. But as Jenny helpfully said yesterday, we'll all just do what we can do. So let's see how we get on and then we can talk about it later. So we're going to think about um, making therapy with families visible. How did, how did therapy in the minds of family therapists stop being the kind of purview of the therapist in whose minds the interpretations of the family were going to be made and started moving towards ways of making the family's own practices visible to them as well as to the therapist in the process of the work. Next slide, please. So here we have a little illustration. This is drawn by a six-year-old. Here's the baby inside the mummy with a possible other baby. And the child's preoccupation is also with the, the, the father, who's the man with scant hair, um, and the family in the house. So the focus that the child is bringing us involves the family, if you have a mind to look at it. Next slide, please. After the Second World War, and could I just say that all these slides are going to be made available, so I'm not going to go through them all in great detail. Um, after the Second World War, the Tavistock elders, as I'm calling them, put huge energy into developing practices that had already been started after the First World War, which were therapeutic communities and addressing shell, shell shock, war wounds, war damage, trauma so loss and trauma, and collective therapeutic approaches to mental health were shared between all these three giants, Bobby, Gosling and Eon. There was also another contender, which was Fuchs, and Fuchs started the group analytic approach, which was not in the Tavistock, which also became very influential. In the old days, and I realised in the course of writing this that I am not only talking about elders, but I am an elder, which of course is a bit of a shock. I don't like facing these things. Um, the welfare state was incredibly important. It was a collective to which we all belonged and which did actually nurture us. And, um, you know, orange juice and cod liver oil every morning were hated, but we got it to make us grow and a third of a pint of milk in the school break. So we believed in the idea that the social collective was part of each individual, both for the power to harm and to heal. This concept was opposed by Mrs. Thatcher. There is no such thing as society. Next slide, please. So in the um, child and family department, I would like to emphasize there was a lot of female thinking. It wasn't just run by the men at all. Melanie Klein was the kind of granny behind the psychoanalytical movement. And the child psychotherapy program was really run around Kleinian lines. And Bowlby was actually 
an attachment theorist and wasn't really valued. He was seen as kind of in some way betraying something, I think. I'm not going to dwell on that, that's not really my field. But he was chair of department at the inception of fa the family program. And he legitimized the setting up of the program, although Frieda Martin, who will come on to, was actually the chair at the time. But strangely, and I've talked about this a lot with Sebastian Kramer, um, and also others, he was ignored by family therapy for a very long time, for a decade, really. In fact, I would say more than that. And I think other researchers using attachment models brought him back into attention. But let's just set him aside for a minute. And then we have James and Joyce Robertson, which for those of you who don't know, you should find out, who did these absolutely wonderful documentary films about the effect of separation on children and the uh, children in hospital and in care films, which set audiences weeping across the country and, and on training courses, actually did reform the practices in hospitals where children had not previously been allowed in with their parents and it changed that practice over time. And then the, the later people I'm not going to dwell on because um, although they were very important to me, they weren't important to the department at the time. That's Robert Hind and Joan Stevenson Hind, John Eldkin Bell and Nate Ackerman from New York were both very important in the very early thinking about family therapy, but not so much at the time we came in. And Bowlby was the common link. Next slide, please. So the beginnings of a new chapter, Frida Martin. Frida was a very tough, clever person, sadly went back to the States, uh, to Canada, sorry, a year after I arrived. And she wrote a very early paper on the value of working with a family, which was basically, as many papers are, set aside for probably a decade. Um, but when she was chair of the department, she legitimized the setting up of the family program. And then we have the two real grandparents, which is Rosie Whiffen, who was a medical social worker, a very energetic woman, and brought her determination to give families information rather than treatment again, information, um, education, things that would help them think for themselves. And she worked in New York um, with someone called Ed Arswald, who I didn't, I hadn't realized that till I did this talk, who was the, probably the most wonderful systemic ecological thinker. Um, but he used too many words, and so people couldn't quite ever get to the end of his articles. But he really was an incredible thinker. So that gave Rosie the courage to come back and want to change the frame. And then John Bing Hall, who had a long and um, quite passionate engagement with adolescents and had worked with Peter Bruggen um, at Hillend, he had a preoccupation with the inner stories that family carry, families carry. And he had worked with Sally Box in the adolescent department workshops where they used the psychoanalytic frame for thinking about interactions between families. And John was very committed to this. And we actually spent quite a lot of time in the first two or three years engaging with that work. Um, but John also had strong attachment links to John Bowlby. Uh, again, I won't say too much because we need to move on. Next slide, please. So um, as my dear friend and colleague, Gwyn Daniel pointed out, um, I am also a living elder. And so I should talk about my own experience. Um, so I'm now talking about as I entered this interesting institution, as part of the first group of what were called Sheldon Fellows. We were called Fellows, I like that bit. Um, we didn't have to pay, basically. Someone had raised some money and we were seen as equals because we'd all had at least five years experience of working with families by the time we got there. And my prior training, really, I want to go back to the LSE, which was the most extraordinary training. And I know that both Gwyn Daniel and Charlotte Burke did some of that training. Um, I worked that, that social psychiatry was a huge influence, which involved thinking about Lang and Chef and Zatz and what and, and what creates madness 
from society and what within families creates madness within the individual. And this was all in very powerful, heady stuff. And we brought that with us, but it wasn't developed within the clinic, probably partly because Lang's methods were so esoteric. Um, and also, I, both I and Tessa Jarl, who comes in the next slide, worked at the Maudsley. And so we brought in group analytic approaches, um, large group approaches, and I brought with me behavioral work, um, which was not really something that was practiced at the Tavi, but was very useful in working with families. So the other legend here is Robin Skinner, who was always outside the clinic, but was kind of in dialogue with or in rival with, depending on what point in time we take. And I worked at Woodbury Down with Robin, where we really took a community approach. We worked in people's homes, we worked in schools, and one or two other community settings, but basically homes and schools as well as the clinic. And our population, and before this I'd been a child care officer, as we were called then, in Islington, so I knew the area pretty well, so I'd been around it for four or five years. Caribbean, Turkish, Greek families, Nigerian families who often were here to study, and their kids were basically set aside in, in terrible child minding conditions. So there was a very painful tension there between the parents' own um, movement forwards and what might be happening with their kids. Um, and then I did this work with Elaine Arnold, a, a dear long-term colleague, who was looking at um, lone, depressed Caribbean mothers. Elaine is also Caribbean. And Lennox Thomas, who was a young probation officer at the time, used to come and chat as well. So there was a lot of um, discussion about Caribbean family, and I'll put it in parenthesis. Of course, there isn't only one family, but family structures, family forms, how they were suffering from loss and fragmentation because of all the relatives who'd been left back home. And I think I really did bring that with me. And the question is, was there a home for all that work at the Tavi? So I'll come back to that. Next slide, please. So Robin Skinner, I've said that. Oh, I want to mention Tessa. Tessa was, I'm not sure she'd already be, become a Labour MP, but she'd been working in local politics pretty much all her adult life. So the emphasis in the group was on wider social and political context of thinking family. And I think that was very important in those early days. And then in the later 1970s, there was an explosion of what I can call mutual influence between other family therapy practitioners with the, with the Tavistock across the UK, because the Association for Family Therapy was set up. And shortly after that, the formation of the Institute of Family Therapy. And the interesting thing about that is that there were interlocking staff teaching groups from different institutions. So the TAVI influenced that, but that also influenced the TAVI because, for example, Rosie would be the, was the clinical lead of the Institute. Um, I became the training director later on. So there was a lot of to and fro. And this is not to diss the TAVI, but it's to say I, I liked, I loved Sarah's metaphor about rhizomes. I can't quite spell that word, but anyway, it was very tangled up. But it was also, I think it was very creative at the time. And we also did a lot of fun and games. You know, we did sculpts, we did genograms, we did role plays. We also did quite a lot of taking the piss at the end of um, term, doing different kinds of reproductions of things we'd learnt or felt were completely ridiculous or where we felt we'd failed. Next slide, please. So, this is part of my perspective, and this is where I decided to go rather than talking too much about models. So um, I was very, because perhaps partly because of being at the Maudsley and working alongside Michael Russer, I was always very interested in the, I suppose I should say, I was also chair of the Association of Child Psychiatry and Psychology in the middle of the 70s. And I was very interested in epidemiological research on children's well-being the stresses and resiliences for children, what makes it better or worse. And then there were some wonderful 
trial development cohorts led by Judy Dunn, which was studying the daily details of children's intimate lives. So, you know, not the broad brushstroke out there in the community, but actually how do kids talk to each other when they're on their own? How do big sibs influence little sibs? What do children pick up from what their parents say? Um, that sort of study, which was tremendously relevant to working with families. And then the Child Health Services Committee, which went on much longer than it should have done and involved masses of research into children's health, um, which I was on. It was supposed to be only one day a month, but of course, as you all know, one day a month turns into many hours of reading. Okay, next slide, please. So given that we'd all started working in different places, what did we, what did we manage to work out? I've been, I've been aided here by having some papers I wrote at the time. These were common approaches before we began to theorize how to do it. This is what we did. The whole family in the room together, at least once, because everybody faced the fact that they probably weren't going to manage it every time. Try and understand the relationships between the presenting problem um, and what we could see, what we could observe, and then what we could begin to inquire about that was going on in the family and the relationships between the family and others, the world outside. Thinking about ethnicity and culture and the implications for work. Developing a non-pathologizing stance. Now this really to me is one of the most interesting contributions that family therapy made. And I think I'm going to say it because you've been talking about the 70s now and you all had time to change. There was, there was a tremendous pathologizing of families that were not standard two parents, 2.4 children. I mean, you know, that's in parentheses. But it was very hard being a lone mother headed family. Um, we had to really work on changing, I won't say our own, but I will say all of us collectively as therapists, ideas about what constitutes a good enough, healthy enough family. And we can come back to that in the discussion. A multiple ways of bringing the inside out, by that I mean making a family enable themselves to see the processes they were bringing. And this is when I think, you know, some creative and weird, but also very fruitful stuff went on. We did genograms, and I could go down a bit. Genograms, sculpts, drawings across the room. Um, we did talking in front of the family, so working in pairs, but we didn't use the screen then. We just sat together in the room with the family and talked to each other in front of the family. A lot of families really liked that because they felt everything was very open. And then the big struggle to find a way of talking on the family's terms, not using jargon, but trial and error to find collaborative languaging, let's say, ways of talking which made sense to them, but where we felt that what we wanted to, to bring also yeah, also was available because, you know, there's always a tendency in therapy and family therapy is just as bad as any other therapy to create complex language, which then isn't available unless you've learned it. And um, I think that's something I've been very keen on maintaining. Next slide, please. So fairly straightforward things that we looked at. These could be called domains of family we could just say things we looked at in the family. Um, and these are obviously things that you'd understand. Affect, alliances and boundaries, who sided with who, who backed up who, who undermined who. Um, terribly important and, and, and fascinating. It's an ongoing preoccupation in family therapy. Um, communication. How did people talk to each other? Not just tone. But how did the tone go with the nonverbal ways that they behaved? And there was a very early brilliant paper by someone called Bugenthal, which I really valued, where she looked at a number of sessions in which 
mothers might be talking in a particular way, you know, say it had a warm and inviting tone, but would have really grim visages, or they might have an expression that was very warm and sweet, but be using biting and sarcastic language. Um, and I think looking at those discrepancies, and I'm saying this for those of you who might be here, but don't always do family work, are tremendously valuable ways of bringing, you know, your perceptions into the work you do in whatever setting. And then, of course, we looked at discipline, and then we had to look at inherited experience. How did people view beating their children, to put it straightforwardly, and what kind of tradition did that come from? How could we address that in a context when beating had not yet become against the law, but was still seen as a necessary adjunct to bringing up a child properly? Next slide, please. So patterns that connect, this became a way of thinking that we all found we could join together in looking at. Outer and inner health, people and families who live closely together develop patterns of interaction which become, can become unthought or habits. And I was very interested in this. I thought the whole Bateson contributed to this thinking um, for me most, because he talked about the way in which people actually give up thinking about what they do in the course of daily life. You know, you just get on with it. And sometimes that becomes problematized and people get stuck in unhappy ways or mad inducing ways. So we spent a lot of time thinking about that, as all therapists do, I think. Then when negative patterns repeat over generations, they have to be addressed at more than one generational level and at different points in the system. And that might mean going to somewhere outside the family, who the family see as persecuting. So negative patterns in family and society can become part of the way a person thinks and feels about themselves. I think this is a very interesting business and one that I hope we will go on talking about because it really relates to so many aspects of what is now being talked about um, on social media. I don't want to specify because I'm not sophisticated enough, but, you know, obviously external dialogues about racism or mis misogynistic dialogues over time, when repeated, become part of the way people may think about themselves. And we looked at this a lot, internalising of external patterns and derogatory ways of speaking both within the family, within institutions, um, people's workplaces. Very interesting that. Uh, so this was part of, again, developing more collaborative co uh, conversations. So homophobic thinking. Homophobic thinking, I want to just say this because I think it's something that must have changed. We'd hardly begun to think about this. My own father was gay and decided that he would tell me he was later when I was a teenager. And it was barely talkable about. I mean, he couldn't talk about it with me, but it had only been decriminalized when the program began for seven years. And dad died under criminal, you know, jurisdiction. Um, so I think we ha I think when we have these conversations, we have to think about which decade are we in, what was in the air what was available for people to take into their minds and then, you know, think about. And to me, this is where social media is such an extraordinary tool because it opens up conversations that, you know, we couldn't possibly have even thought of, to be honest, and came to think of later. Um, another thing I think is remarkable, I don't know if any of you listen to it, is the listening project on, um, on the radio. Um, you know, on there we have a father having a child on his own um, by donor, um, donor egg and with the surrogate mother having a conversation about his experiences. And this was totally inconceivable in the 1970s. You know, I think we just have, this was 50 years ago. I'm half a century ago as I speak now. Next slide, please. So these were just some of the different brothers and sisters across the Atlantic 
who came to help us think. Um, and I'm not going to go into this in detail because, you know, you can read about it in books or we can have more talks later. But Ackerman brought us all kinds of things, sculpting, genogram, role play, um, family um, exercises where we worked out, you know, our relationships with each other according to family terms. Philadelphia brought us structural family therapy, which I found completely absorbing at the time, although I came to find it very intrusive later. Um, and Harry Aponte, who was an African-American therapist, was one of our first visiting training uh, teachers and um, worked with a Caribbean family from the UK. A, a beautiful interview, which sadly has got lost. Like all the, all the, I have to say that all the early tapes which we had at the Tavistock have got lost. And I don't know why, so that's another interesting thing. And then in the night, Carl Whitaker was a, a wonderful idiosyncratic maverick, but not copyable except by men. Uh, so I won't talk about him. Um, in the 1980s, we got into the search for higher levels of meaning. And really, we got into the cybernetics challenge to uh, systems, to psychotherapy. And the, I just wanted, to, I had to write a little note about this. Um, the, uh, unlike working sort of intensely and alongside and in the family, which is what the structural work has encouraged us to do, the Milan team, and I'm focused on Bosco and Joaquin because they're the ones I knew best, um, managed, really taught us how to maintain a distance, but to be curious and to be curious and positive connotation of everything that went on in the system, however weird it appeared. I think were two of the great gifts that they brought in a general way to family therapy. Um, so that was a very different style of working because the team stayed distant from the family. Whereas with structural work, you were right in there. That's something else we could say more about. But they provided a particularly valuable way of working with highly complex multi-generational family systems where you might otherwise get so tangled up that you couldn't be effective at all. So we thank them for everything they left us. Next slide, please. So now we move to the clinical research groups and I'm hotting up for the last five minutes of my talk. Um, I think that a lot of us wanted to focus on the application of systemic thinking to um, different challenges that family life was bringing to the clinic. And this echoed changes in the law the, the in the previous decade, which had empowered different kinds of actions in families, but also led to different kinds of discontinuity and breakup. So there was the Divorce Act, decriminalizing homosexuality, migration, and new family forms in the UK that relied on different integral structures of their own. For example, three generational households, extended families living together in one household, and mother-headed lone parent households with or without loose family kin who would provide support and often not having that support. Um, and then we had children's changing image of what a proper family was as a result of these wider changes in society and the question of whether or not therapists had kept up with these changes. And this was something I always felt very strongly about. I felt that sometimes therapists were still insisting on certain kinds of family, which were in fact changing. And so to insist on older models was inappropriate. So depathologizing again, different family forms in the mind of therapists. Thank you, next slide, please. So this meant what happened to family coherence. Now research from outside the clinic helped us think about these changes, but it also, for me, challenged former notions of family coherence on which earlier systems theorizing been based. You know, if you believe that the system reproduces itself over different generations in different ways, 
that's one strand of thinking, but there's also the way in which things change so drastically in another generation because the rules of the social system are different, that you have to reconsider your theorizing. So I looked at Susan Gollenbach's work on children in lesbian families. I'm lucky enough to meet her quite early on in her work, so I was able to pick that up. Dunn's work, which later on examined that question of what remains coherent in the face of family change from a child's perspective, so further need to think about fracture and loss and the conservation of health and family ties and then work with Gwyn, Gwyn Daniel and Paul Thompson growing up in step families where we looked at the changing lives of children from a, a national cohort. Uh, next slide please. So Amelia and I decided we'd set up the separation and divorce project and we, this was a very creative burst in the in the clinic. Um, students could choose which group they wanted to attach themselves to. And we met for two hours or two and a half hours on one morning. Um, and people did projects that related to different aspects of this, like working in schools, the problem of conception um, for some people. Uh, you know, we were quite loose in the way we thought about bringing in family. Um, and different changing models of family, but we focused on separation and divorce. We looked at children's understandings of family processes. And we obviously inevitably came to look at high conflict and violence in family processes. So I think we've now got a few slides. Is that right? Can we go forward? So this was a perfect family as one boy saw it. Daddy, mummy brother, sister, but in fact, it was a single lone headed parent family with a father in prison. Next slide, please. This is my extended family. So this is one side, as you can see a huge Asian family in this case, um, tremendously positive, but on the other side, which I haven't shown, there's only about two people. So a complexity of um, the balance between two parents and the family they create. Next slide, please. This is a family where there are no parents at all. It's a sibling group. And the little girl who drew this, who actually had concealed parentage, I think would be the way of putting it. Interestingly enough, didn't put herself in this picture. And I think it's related to her uncertainty about her own conception of parenthood. Next, next one, please. And here we come to violence, which about a third, what Amelia and I did um, was we saw clinically all the families we researched in the end because it fitted better with the department's responsibility for managing the work. Um, and a third of the cases we saw there was violence. So this is a drawing by a little boy. That's me standing by the door, he says. And that's daddy, previously drawn as a man with big hands, having a go at mum as a contact visit. Next slide, please. So let's end by thinking about health and well-being again, back to the elders. How does health and well-being in society fit with the way we think about ourselves? The social collective is part of each individual with the power to harm and to heal. Families change and the meanings of social collective will also change. It's not the same social collective for each of us. It remains a valid concept for each family, but it has to be explored in terms of who they value, who they see as their support network who they look to. And again, I think social media has probably got a huge part to play here, but I'm not going to venture into that. Maybe we could chat about it later. So internal dialogues and external practices remain mutually influencing for good and for harm. And I think a lot of the destruction 
that we hear, particularly self-destruction, that we see and work with now among young women, in my case in particular, um, also comes from the power for harm from social media. Next slide, please. So now I'm going to introduce Sara, and Sara will introduce Jenny. And we're going to talk about their work around different contexts for healing, because I think they've both done incredibly innovative and interesting work. And I look forward to hearing about it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jill. And um, I suppose as Jenny and I, as Jenny and I were both fortunate to be sitting at the feet of you and uh, Amelia and David and Rosie and John, you know, and we feel very fortunate to have kind of soaked up some of that wisdom. And um, I was part of the um, project you undertook with Amelia and um, it's had a, that kind of listening to that and being part of it has had a huge, huge impact on me. Um, I'm just going to start with something about the systemic psychotherapy discipline, because that's what Sarah started by asking me to do, and then talk about my work in general practice. Um, I just need to say that um, the wise people that Jill has spoken about and, um, worked hard and included Barbara Dale as well, and um, John, Rosie, David, Jill, Sebastian um, to um, create um, a systemic psychotherapy discipline in the clinic. Um, before 2002, we were employed in our first professions. And um, that was at a time when people were running training courses all over the world and also running courses training family therapists. Um, but we were um, as I say, employed in our first profession. And um, so it was a huge achievement that we became recognized as a discipline in the clinic. And it, um, it meant that we could um, join other teams, join multidisciplinary teams and work alongside our colleagues um, with different um, professional orientations. Um, at that time, we were only employed in the child and family department, and that more or less continues, although um, there are family therapists, as um, Natalina and Shannon will say, who are employed in the gender identity um, clinic. Um, so having quite an interest in working with adults, the only way that um, I was able to work with um, adults and I've worked in adult mental health was outside the clinic. Um, so it came from, from, my, um, from the training, which was a fairly cruel training. It was the first MSc in family therapy and we had everything thrown at us, including exams and theses and the requirement to run a 30 hour um, family therapy course, which I have to say just about killed me at the thought of it. But um, I, uh, one of my friends and, um, was a GP and I was struggling to find somebody to teach. And he said, how about teaching some GPs? So um, I ran um, a, a, a 10 week training course for GPs in Hertfordshire. And um, I was kind of at the stage of thinking, you know, really sitting at the feet of GPs and not really um, thinking I could ever teach them anything. Um, but I learned so much from that experience because um, we ran a systemic training course um, in thinking about what else might be happening um, in the lives of the patients that were consulting them. And so new to them were the ideas of drawing family trees. I mean, it was going on in the Highgate group practice, but nevertheless, in Hertfordshire, people hadn't really thought about that and thinking about things like life cycle issues and what else was going on in the families who were consulting them um, and, the, and the individuals. 
I think what's exciting about working in general practice is that people consult their GPs from birth to death. It's a, it's a lifelong service, which I think is unique. I don't think there are any other services that um, offer um, support people throughout their lives. Um, and the course that we were thinking of, or that we ran and our discussions were about considering the um, culture and beliefs of the family in relation to the mental and physical illness. And Glenn, I've forgotten to ask you to move to the next slide, my apologies. Um, so we did a lot of work on the culture and beliefs of the families, especially in relation to mental and physical illness and the influences on a patient's life, which determine what they present with. And um, I was talking to my GP colleague last night about, um, you don't really go to the GP or probably to a therapist to say what's going right in your life. So you're there to talk about what's wrong and um, to get some solution to that. And so there's little opportunity to think about what else might be going on in, in a patient's family and um, to influence the consultation. And the other thing for GPs is um, the pressure on time that they're expected to know and know what's wrong with people and also the um, constraints of a 10, 10 minute consultation, which means that it's very, there's very little opportunity to be curious. So um, part of the conversations we had were thinking about how GPs within the practice can find the time to talk to one another and also piece together aspects of people's lives because um, G patients consult different GPs about different issues. Can I have the next slide, please, Glenn? Um, I think what interests me was that Western medicine is constructed as individualistic. Um, individuals go to the GP, you're, you're, you're consulting about that person's problem. And also um, what I became very aware of in working with general practice was that people go to different GPs to different bits of them. And when we had practice meetings and we would talk about different aspects of the family and try and piece together um, what people were taking, particularly the patients that we were worried about, suddenly a story was constructed and a genogram was constructed about what was going on in the family of origin, what was going on for the parents, what many life cycle issues for the individuals, which influenced what patients brought and also um, whether they presented physical or emotional difficulties, you know, and I think one of the reasons I feel passionately about working in general practice is that, you know, you don't have to define somebody as having a physical or an emotional or psychiatric illness. It can all be held within the practice. And I think that, that I think I found very important. So surgeries are set up to offer a holistic approach and everybody goes to the doctor. So um, you can think about the physical, the meaning of the physical and the emotional and the family um, context, as well as um, the social influences on people's lives, such as poverty and unemployment and um, different crises um, that might be happening. And there's the opportunity to um, hold that within a GP surgery. So I started to work in um, general practice in Hertfordshire in 1988. And I, I'm afraid to say I still work there and I, I love it because I see so many different people and so many different families. And um, it, uh, it, it just is a very rich experience. Um, the next slide, please. Um, I then want to talk about it. I went to a conference, um, fam family therapy conference, um, and um, there was a presentation by 
group of GPs uh, about working systemically um, and the, the, the effect of their work on families. And um, Jack Jardana, who's a GP in Sheffield, said, um, does anybody, does any family therapist want to come and join me in working together? Um, because I, you know, I feel quite isolated. I work in a very disadvantaged practice. Um, I, I feel very alone and I would like to be able to think about having broader conversations with the people that consult to me. So I said, I will. And um, that started um, to fortnightly commutes to Sheffield um, to consult to his morning surgery. And the way we managed that, and he had, he had as I say, a service that worked with a very diverse population. Um, and th the effect of the steel, clo steel work closures had had a devastating effect on the economy. So there were people who were really suffering from poverty and deprivation and pain that was both physical and emotional. Um, and he was a very systemic GP, he, st he still is. And uh, I remember sitting in on his surgery and uh, a woman from a traveler family came with a child with scabies. And um, so he said, there's no point in prescribing for you. So he did a prescription for all of the families on the site. Um, and he kind of would think about whole communities and what they would need. Um, so the way we worked together was I would go up and I would live supervise his morning surgery. I go up on a Monday and um, people would know I was coming and would often sign in to that surgery that, that morning. And um, I would intervene on the conversations between the, the GP and the therapist. And um, just comment on what else might be going on in people's lives. And I think there were quite a lot of what else conversations, what else questions. And he would also invite people that he was sort of stuck with, people who were consulting, um, well, it was a definition of frequent attendance, 15 times a year, who would be coming and he would refer on to different um, secondary services and who would um, returned to the surgery. So I would sit in on those consultations and he would feel that there was an emotional um, basis to what people were consulting with, which might be a lot of physical pain as well. And I would be, because of my role as a consultant to him and supervisor, I would be asking what else might be going on. And as, a, as I was introduced as a therapist, I could think about therapeutic questions and thinking about other relationships in the family. And I would then, um, if people wanted to have a chat with me, and these were people who really would feel very shamed to attend uh, a mental health or would, would refuse referral to mental adult mental health service, I would um, offer usually two sessions to think about what else was going on in their lives, what was happening for them and um, the effect of their symptoms on them. And then at the end of that, we would go back to the GP relationship and talk about the conversations we'd had. And people would talk about um, their loneliness, the loss of their jobs, worries about other family members, which they wouldn't have taken to the um, discussion with the GP. And I fed that back to the GP and he then was able to have different conversations with them on, you know, in the future. And um, it changed what he, what he was doing. And I asked him, I've, I've been in touch with him and I'm going to read something because I asked him um, what, what effect that might have had on him and the, the, his experience of it. And he said um, that patients liked me to be there. He liked the fact that two people were holding them in mind. And he said that for him, it was the feeling that he's having live supervision, which GPs don't have. And he said it helped him continue working as a GP 
when he might have got burned out. He hadn't realized how many people we saw had been abused or significantly affected by events that had happened in their lives and that he was able to spend time listening to their stories and that time spent listening to them made, made a difference. Um, he said it, it, having three people in the room at the same time and to use a sort of reflecting team um, to think with the family allowed the patient to have different conversations with him thereafter. And um, one of the kind of little research outcomes that we had was that people, there were about 14 people who we saw who had been um, consulting frequently, 15 times a year, and that stopped. And um, they um, were, the, the consultations were much less. And some of them were able to think about um, attending um, adult mental health services because they started to talk about what was going on emotionally. Next slide, please. Um, from that, we um, there, there were a group of people um, called the Thinking Families Group, who were a group of GPs and family therapists and uh, who started to work together. And um, we live supervise one another practice. So we would travel between London and Sheffield and Newcastle and Hertfordshire and Cumbria and sit in on the surgeries um, that, uh, in which we were working and live supervise our work with our clinic patients. Um, and um, that was very enriching. We learned, learned a lot about family health and um, working systemically within within the practice and we we started to have a regular insert in context on um, working in GP practices um, and quite a lot has come out of that um, John Lorna has done a lot of writing at the Tavistock about working in general practice and Jenny also did quite a lot of work so I think a group of people interested in that um, came together um, as I say, I've continued to work in general practice in Hertfordshire and um, the way I work with the GP, GPs there is that if they're worried about somebody, I mean, I, they, they may make an ordinary referral to me or they might, we might have a joint session because if people are consulting, there's quite a quite a shift to think that you need to see a therapist. I think it create it is quite a, you know, there's something that has a lot of meaning for people. So, um, and often that's a struggle. So certainly uh, Mark Brownfoot, who I work with now, might suggest several times that patients that consult him frequently need to see a therapist or go to adult mental health. And, they, they would struggle with that. And so I'm just called Sarah who likes to talk to people mostly. And um, we have a joint session. So he hands people over to me and thinks I can help. And um, those that kind of joint work and the working together with people. And we usually agree that we will talk to one another between sessions if we're worried. And that's, that's engaged people and also we don't have any dropouts really people the fact that people feel contained in the surgery which is part of their culture where they go for ordinary things and it doesn't involve a transition to a secondary service um, has made a lot of difference could you move to the next slide please Glenn um, so um, before COVID, of course, we could have many more, um, many more um, joint sessions, but now uh, we're working separately and on Zoom and often on the phone, because I think as people, a lot of people working find that it's much harder to, for many people, but to, to access Zoom and things like that. So we have a lot of phone conversations. Um, next slide, please, Ben. Um, 
so we have a lot of phone conversations with um, with patients, but and we're trying to set up the possibility of having some shared sort of WhatsApp conversations, but we haven't really got that far. And part of that is also because the GPs are feeling under such a lot of pressure at the moment. Um, but I think also having somebody in the surgery does relieve some of the pressure from the on the GP and um, you know, enables them to kind of, yeah, some, I mean, there's a person I was thinking about who kept, um, who, who was attending very frequently with um, bowel problems and um, the GP referred to me and um, it widening the conversation about other things that were worrying them and what else was going on in their lives just, just meant that some of the pressure was off the GP who was having a redundant conversation. The other thing I think that's occurred to me in work working general practice is that as she's a therapist, we make our own appointments. And if somebody says, you know, can, when can I see you? You say, yeah, I can fit you in my diary a week on Thursday. The GP has no control over who's seeing them and when they're seeing them. And um, it's occurred to me that they're sort of, you know, it, it's much harder that they, they have people that keep attending and they can't really move that on. So I think sometimes having joint conversations with me does dilute that. Um, and I think the patients find the joint work really helpful. Um, and I just want to really end with um, a quote from somebody. There's a man who we saw, um, who was referred to me not long ago, last year, and uh, he had surprised himself, uh, next slide please, um, Glenn, by losing his temper. Um, he, something had happened with his neighbor and he was a very mild, quiet man. And um, he said, this neighbor made a noise and he went downstairs and he wanted to kill him. And he got, really got so depressed and he was so shocked by his response. And um, he went to the GP and said he thought he was depressed, but he was worried about his anger. Now here's somebody who was referred to me because he was worried, but then of course out came a story of um, childhood sexual abuse, of um, constant abuse as an adult, of um, a loss of confidence, and also um, some issues for him about his sexual orientation, which he hadn't shared with his partner um, and which he had never spoken about to anybody. So this man who had never really thought of talking about himself at all, um, started to make connections and um, says it changed his life. And this, he's just written this back to me when I asked for some feedback. And he said, well, what stands out for me is the dual approach that was taken. I went to the GP for stress, anger, depression, and as expected was prescribed some pills. I'd had pills before, but the difference that time was that GP had the foresight to realize I needed more than just pills and put me in touch with you. Without you two working in concert, I wouldn't be where I am today, which is in a happy and contented place. Again, I know it's partly the pills, but you've taught me to accept the person I am and be happy with that, which I also am. One without the other just wouldn't have worked, but it has to be the right people assisting. And I think the fact that we can work together and decide medication or no medication, and the fact that we talk together, and he was very relieved that we had conversations with one another, that um, he thinks made the difference to us, to him. So the last slide um, is for me, the advantages of working in general practice, which is people engage. On the whole, most people turn up um, and um, feel familiar. They're used to coming into the building, they're used to the receptionist, and they seem to feel much more comfortable with that and it's the familiarity, and also the fact that we can hold on to the both hands. You know, yes, it might be, it might be, it might, you might need pills, and you might need to talk, 
and we'll move between those two things. And most people, when we've asked, have really appreciated the fact that um, the GP and I talk together and with them about what's going on in their lives and how best to um, support them with that. So that's, that's, I think everybody should work in general practice. It's great. And I'm going to pass on to Jenny, who's going to talk about illness. So. Well, thank you very much. And um, hello to everyone here tonight. Um, sorry, just one second. I've just got a technical something. OK, I'm with you. Um, thank you very, very much. And, um, and uh, it's interesting that Sarah and I started um, the family therapy to training together. It was in... 1984, I think. So um, it's particularly special to be speaking here. And of course, um, with Jill, um, who is such an inspirational supervisor too. Uh, leading on from what Jill and Sarah have said, I um, just want to start by saying that underpinning all forms of psychotherapy is the commitment to listen carefully, bear witness to suffering, and where relevant, raise questions and comments that open up the possibility of difference. But what's most specific to systemic theory and practice, as Sarah and Jill have said, is the understanding that one person's experience informs and is informed by interactions with others. And that to make sense of our experience, we need to take account of the context of these experiences, the relational, family, financial, educational, and socio-political context of our lives, including the threats and challenges that we face. In fact, while earlier ideas about therapeutic work with disasters drew on the idea of pre-existing risks um, that would predispose certain people to poor outcomes, there's now considerable evidence that interpersonal, organizational and systemic factors play a large role in mental health and bolstering resilience in the face of exceptional circumstances. And this was very clear in my work in post-conflict Kosovo with families traumatized by the war and subsequently in Greece with refugees, in Northern Greece with refugees. But thinking of context, as Jill said, we're meeting at a time, sorry, just gonna have a sip, when, when there's still um, a time of great uncertainty, um, so much is unknown about COVID, its mutations, the effectiveness of the vaccine, when we're being bombarded with mixed messages and conflicting research, and where government policy is often at odds um, with scientific advice. In addition, reports of doctors and nurses breaking down in tears have become almost commonplace. The emotional and practical financial consequences of the virus and lockdown are having a profound effect on the lives of children, um, young people, adults and older people, as well as society at large. And the impact of the pandemic can be felt throughout our bodies Perceived threat activates the physiological stress uh, reaction that mobilizes glucose and triggering our immune system, so that leading to some increased inflammation and affecting the function of our brain, making us more sensitive to threats. And I'm sure I'm not the only one who sort of jumped when someone's gone past, um, gone past me walking, or even worse, spitting. <laughs> um, current threats have the potential to evoke conscious and unconscious memories of prior trauma. And over the past year, I've seen far more women wanting to talk about childhood sexual abuse for the first time than I ever have in independent practice. And likewise, in a project with refugees, what's become clear that for so many people spending lockdown in a place where home, home does not feel a safe, a safe place without being able to go out and get on with people's, you know, one's own, usual distractions and just for memories, um, conscious and unconscious memories flooding back. So it's been a particularly difficult time for people who've been traumatized. Um, the widespread nature of the pandemic, me pandemic means that in common with our clients or patients, we've been faced with multiple levels of uncertainty and change in our own lives. And if I think about myself oscillating between periods of hypervigilance, confusion, distress, fearing we and our, I and my family might be the next, um, and other times of greater confidence, complacency, maybe you could call it denial, 
as well as worry about the long-term consequences for my grandchildren of growing up in a context when it, instead of touch being a source of comfort, it's a source of potential contamination. The sense of being in it together means it's not unusual for clients to ask how we are and appreciating the concern. Under the circumstances, it can feel churlish, um, churlish not to avoid answerings, bringing into question the boundaries we place about around ourselves. Drawing on her experience of breast cancer, Omen argues that it's misguided to assume people are unaware of our concerns and that although their dilemmas need to remain the focus of work, allowing this to be explicit in the work poses the least, the least disruption to clients' well-being. What that really means in practice is complex because to support others in processing their own experience, we need to disentangle our own thoughts and feelings from what belongs to them and what belongs to us. Returning to the wider sociopolitical context, increased rates of infection and death amongst black and minority ethnic group healthcare professionals and recipients of healthcare have brought racial inequalities to the fore. So it's not a question anymore about whether we address issues of racialization and diversity in our clinical work, training, supervision, but how, when to do it in a way that leads to greater understanding rather than the reverse. But at the same time, Media accounts of the positions of refugees are being mis mix met by mixed, you know, by polarized views ranging from calls for additional support um, to anxiety and blaming them for depleting the UK's resources, including our health, our health service. Migration and the, the migration and the position of insiders, outsiders, belonging and exclusion touch a personal chord for me. My mother emigrated from Lithuania to South Africa to, to escape anti-Semitic pogroms, and my paternal grandparents moved from Limerick but left for South Africa after Ireland's only known anti-Semitic pogrom in 1904. And I suppose I followed a similar script by moving to the UK from apartheid-based South Africa, where I was positioned as white privilege and where, of course, the political spoke very loudly in terms of our upbringing. Arriving at the arriving in England, um, having trained as a clinical psychologist and sort of felt a bit as though I'd had, I was qualified to do all, but maybe a training to do not so very much. Um, I decided to, um, to train as a family therapist. And on reflection, I think some of that is that um, as important as my parents were, I was the second eldest of four. And I think my experience was so much more about not just who I was in relation to my parents, but who I was in relation to my siblings, sort of looking, looking both ways. Um, but arriving at the Tavistock, training as a systemic psychotherapist and subsequently working at the clinic relatively soon after being here, were central to my understanding the socio-political, cultural and relational context in which I was leading, uh, li living. Um, but sorry, just returning to, um, to siblings, um, it was interesting at an end of course lunch one time at Barbara Dale's house, uh, we went around the table saying where we were in, the, in, the, uh, in our family positioning and with the exception of a psychiatrist on the, on the staff group and um, a student who was from a blended family, we were all second or middle children. Um, Sarah and Joanne, I'm not sure where you're at, let lunch and we can continue with that as another conversation. But shortly after joining the systems team, that's when we started focusing on pair, particular areas of concern. And personal professional experiences meant that Barbara Dale, John Bing Hall, and I focused on what was then a much neglected area, which is the impact of illness and disability on families. Having contracted polio at 18, which left him permanently disabled, John decided to focus on disabilities. And I remember his really sensitive work in which he ran his fingers over the head of a young boy who'd had brain surgery and had been left impaired as a result of that. And, um, and I think he'd had a tumor, I assume so, but I, I can't remember. But there was something about, something very sensitive about, he had the permission, but there was also something, this was some, a way of him um, indicating to this young boy that he could really see and connect with his experience. And John, John often talked about that, the importance of actually making some of what's invisible more visible. 
Of course, another aspect of John's work has been the idea of family scripts that many of us aspire to provide our children with the same sort of childhood that we had, while others of us aspire to a corrective script to try to ensure our children are protected from the experiences we went through. But inevitably, life circumstances mean that at times of heightened emotionality, including when one's energy is depleted by chemotherapy or pain, we can find ourselves drawn, drawing on those internalized templates from the past, replicating exactly what we sought to avoid. So while John focused on disability, Barbara and I focused on life-limiting conditions. And we saw as many people, as many families as we could where um, life-threatening illness was mentioned at referral. My interest was inspired by having previously worked with adolescents in renal failure at the Royal Free, but I suspect I was also drawn by childhood memories of my younger and severely, then severely asthmatic brother struggling to breathe and shouting, mummy, do something. And I guess this was what my way of kind of doing something. About three months into the work, we, to my surprise, we realized that the majority of the referrals related to parental illness. And then we realized that while considerable attention is paid to families when a child or adolescent is ill, with the exception of HIV AIDS, this is really rarely true when a mother or father is diagnosed with cancer, MS, or another life li limiting condition. Um, this is starting to change, but nonetheless, many parents still don't receive the help they need in deciding how to share their diagnosis with children and what this means for their relationship. Um, although each family's experience is obviously unique, and in fact, I must just say that I'm aware in talking about the illness work that this might touch a personal chord for people. And I just, I don't, I just want to recognize and say that I respect that. Um, several patterns seem to emerge. Um, inevitably, responses seem to differ. In some cases, families were able to draw on memories and experiences to recreate some sense of continuity between their past, present, and anticipated future. For some people, illness, illness, surgery, death became, bereavement rather, <laughs> became a turning point, an opportunity to, to live a very different sort of life, a life that was much more com com comfortable and fulfilling. But for others, prior loss, trauma, and the debilitating effects of the condition and the treatment meant that they remained haunted by the painful gap between who they were, who they'd become, and who they still long to be. As I've said before, loss and trauma associated with illness, or loss and trauma, or current loss and trauma, in this case with illness, can re-evoke conscious and unconscious memories of past experiences. So for imagine just waking up from surgery to find the bars on the side of the bed to protect you from falling can just re-evoke memories of other forms of restraint. And because we were seeing people at the Tavistock mental health clinic rather than just on a ward, I would assume, um, quite a high number of the families we saw were families where there'd been extremely traumatic experiences in the past. Um, guilt and blame were a common feature particularly when children were exposed to experiences well beyond what's seen as age appropriate, which could include helping a mother onto a commode. And while some form of self-reflection is useful, um, as I'm sure you know, guilt can be paralyzing because it limits our ability to be there for children and compromises our ability to provide the secure and can compromise the ability to provide the secure boundaries that also are sustaining at times of uncertainty. I mean, one of the other struggles was often about how to balance caring for yourself as an ill parent with caring for others. Arguably, I know um, Kathy Weingarten talks about this being um, um, more complex for women where um, women's sense of self is so much more bound up with caring for, caring for children. I, I, I think that's, you know, that would be an interesting thing to come back to about thinking about gender. The other thing that, that Jill's touched on is the differences between verbal and nonverbal communication, because many children are not told what's happening to their parents. And when they aren't told, they, um, they draw on what they see and overhear in developing their own stories. So three-year-old Libby, who hadn't been told that her mother's cancer had returned, drove a little car 
around the room saying beep bop, beep bop. And when she was asked what the car, where the car was going, she said, it's taking mommy to hospital because she's very sick. That family faced another kind of challenge. Libby's 11 year old brother was teased when people found out that his parents were in a same sex relationship. Um, he was teased at his junior school. So when he moved on to senior school, they decided not to say anything. But her anticipation of one of his mum's impending death forced them to be more open, to ensure he received the support that he needed, which meant that he was faced with making sense of what this knowledge meant to his teachers and his friends at the same time as coming to terms with the impending death of his mother. There's been a huge shift in attitudes since I saw this family at the Tavistock in the 1990s, but it's still the case that homophobic discrimination influences the lives of many children and families today. Refugees, asylum seekers, and other migrants face additional challenges, the challenges of living apart from close family, which limits the possibility of providing and receiving support. Different ideas about health, illness, treatment. And in fact, when I did do that, do um, work in, I had the opportunity or the privilege of working both in King's Cross and, and Hobson within um, deprived areas with um, a high percentage of people from who'd migrated from elsewhere. This was a very steep learning curve in relation to cultural constructs of health and illness. And I remember um, Rachel Hopkins, the GP at Killick Street um, in King's Cross, um, saying to me, Jenny, what do I do with my patients who come talking about body pain that doesn't fit at all with the kind of parameters of, of what I know? Um, in fact, what Rachel was, was emphasizing too in her work is something that whether even in view talking about medically unexplained symptoms, it's still distress, whether it's physical or psychological, and we need to treat it as that. Um, the other thing is that there was far less, there's obviously people would have far less understanding of the medical system and access to care. So I remember working in a refugee camp in Northern Greece, coming across a young man from Afghanistan who was in tears because um, um, it, then an aid worker had offered to take his brother to the hospital uh, for blood transfusion because he had thalassemia. But the aid worker forgot, <laughs> which meant that his brother didn't receive the transfusion and the blood was wasted. Just switching back um, to, to the Tavistock, our work with illness led to the establishment of a multidisciplinary course for healthcare professionals on a, on addressing um, the challenges families facing illness, disability and death um, face. And in addition, in addition to some formal lectures, a number of, um, number of clinicians um, contributed to it. And in addition to these lectures, what people I think found most helpful was just the space to reflect and think about the moral, clinical, relational dilemmas that they were facing as well as the personal resonances to this work, which inevitably there will be. As an independent psychotherapist, um, psych COVID formed the backdrop to all clinical work over the last year, as I'm sure is the case for all of you. I've also been seeing some families where one or more people contracted, contracted the virus, which has sadly included bereavement. None of us, and certainly not me, are experts in working with COVID. But I have found that systemic work with other forms of illness, loss and trauma offered a helpful framework, including the ideas of attending to the relational and contextual nature of experience, the impact of past experiences on the past on, on the present, the inextricable links between the physical, psychological and relational, and the role of family, organization, or and community factors in bolstering resilience. I was asked to see a couple in their late 60s. Robert had had two COVID related strokes, resulting in problems with his eyesight, short term memory, and in his wife's view, not his, was far more disinhibited emotionally. In the past, he had a high, high profile, high pressure job, and it was unlikely he'd ever be able to go back. Having stopped working when he was ill, his wife had gone back to work but she was finding it impossible to balance working full-time with being there for Robert. 
Some of the challenges they faced were particular co to COVID. When Robert was in a coma and might not survive, Maria and the adult sons were unable to see him, speak to the medical team and advocate on his behalf. Because he contracted the virus shortly after it emerged in the UK, there was far less understanding of the link with neurological complications, which just compounded the, the anxiety that the family and indeed the medical team faced. But they were also faced with challenges other couples and families um, experience when one person becomes more of the cared for and their partner and children become carers, including shifts in patterns of care, power, dependency, Robert's fear of becoming a burden and being abandoned, Maria's fear of being overwhelmed, differences in their readiness to share how they felt, how they balanced hope with acceptance, and tensions related to far earlier aspects of their relationship. Robert spoke about feeling hollow, lonely, struggling to make sense of the gap between who he was and he, who he had been and who he is now. Maria felt exhausted, frustrated with Robert's preoccupation with his own, own position, which just left her feeling lonely and unsupported. As in all systemic work, the aim was to try to facilitate a conversation they couldn't have on their own, to create a space to hear and acknowledge what one another were going through physically as well as emotionally, share what they'd like to change, but also what they'd like to stay the same, what's carried them through difficult times, including blow-ups, conversations about intimacy, as well as practical considerations, such as setting aside some time which is free from COVID-19 talk. I think, you know, whenever I hear people speaking, it, what people are saying is primarily expressed in terms of we. I'd always be interested in the I, because as important as a shared understanding is, there's something about, could one person's experience be completely subsumed by the other? And, um, you know, do they have a voice? I think that's important. But equally, if all that I'm hearing is about I, I'd be asking questions that would bring in some sense of the we, which can be so sustaining. Likewise, if all I'm hearing about illness, all I'm hearing is about illness, I try and bring in what else is happening in their lives and vice versa. I suppose one of the other things to say is that COVID inevitably was formed the backdrop to conversations in, in supervision. Death, grief, loss were an ever-present ever theme with discussions ranging from the desire to avoid the emotional impact of so many people dying in isolation, as well as the difficulties of dealing with one's own grief um, at the death of a client who people have known for some time in the face of relatives much greater suffering and hardship. Elsewhere, expressions of loss reflect what's been termed moral injury, the profound psychological distress that results from actions or the lack of actions that violate one's moral code and give rise, can give rise to negative thoughts about oneself and others. As for example, when managers faced life and death decisions about access to scarce resources and where the pressure of work meant that there was less opportunity to reflect, increasing the likelihood of adopting extreme positions in relation to personal risk, personal risk and the risk to others. Um, Marita talked about, Marita, um, uh, a, a psychologist, talked about feeling clumsy and incompetent wearing PPE in trying to comfort bereaved parents after the death of their young son. Danny, a social worker, felt awful about being unable to provide an accurate assessment of the mental capacity of a client with de dementia to try and assess whether she could actually live, a, live alone over the phone, particularly when family were saying they thought that she could. There's no way of her actually being able to assess it. Likewise, Raj, manager, who manages a physiotherapy service, expressed anger, shame, despair about being unable to provide his team the PPE they needed. And despite attempts to fight on their behalf, they felt he let them down. While he was attempted to stand up and be counted and, and, go and engage in face-to-face -face work on the wards, it felt indulgent to waste, to waste scarce PPE um, on himself when his primary role was as a manager. Questions of diversity, racism and inequality have long been part of supervision, but the pandemics brought it to the fore. 
Over the past year, I held two workshops for the hospital-based family therapists and psychologists I supervise. And one of the key issues people wanted to address was how to move conversations on diversity uh, in healthcare systems forward without um, black and minority um, professionals having to take responsibility. And the conversation was about acknowledging that racism is everyone's responsibility and discussions about what everyone in the group could do to take things forward. Even small things can make an enormous difference. So after the first, um, after the first session, one of the psychologists had actually written to the trust board arguing that, that the, um, the hospital needed to do more um, to address issues of um, diversity, racism within the hospital. And um, you know, there may have been other factors, but her letter certainly seemed to have been a catalyst for taking things forward. Inevitably, you know, to, to affect change, there needs to be change at an organizational level, but also at a personal level. And so as clinicians, this is something that means being alert to our own prejudices and the complicated feelings that arise from trying to bridge the gap between ourselves and unfamiliar lives. It also touches on challenges that are pertinent to work with illness and death, which does involve being, re being ready to make to, to take informed risks, dig deep, engage with uncertainty, learn from mistakes, and be moved by the sufferings of one of another without being overwhelmed by the feelings it evokes in us. To conclude, I don't know if any of you have read um, um, what Rachel Clark, a palliative care consultant, has written. There have been a number of articles by, by her in the um, in the newspapers. And one of the things she said, um, she's been working with COVID this year, and she said, there is almost no situation that cannot be made better by someone reaching out with love and tenderness. The pandemics forced us to recognize the inescapable interconnection between ourselves and others, bringing the body into increased visibility whilst the enforced separation can trigger, and I'm sure has, feelings of rejection. It's also been an invitation to find new ways of becoming human and closer than before. When I asked, um, one, uh, when I asked one of the um, supervision, uh, one of the hospital teams I supervised, um, what had carried them through the more difficult times, they mentioned distraction, structure, and the financial benefits of working. But possibly the most important thing was the kindness of colleagues, which echoes Frankel and Cho's assertion that we are helped by being part of a community, a community of care. So I'd like to thank the Tavistock and the systems team in particular for the theoretical and therapeutic scaffolding that's enabled me to contribute to that, to that community of care. And that's me. <laughs> Jenny, thank you very much. Sarah and Jill, thank you very much. Um, you have um, each produced um, some, some fascinating and moving ideas which we will think about. We're going to take a very brief comfort break, um, a, a short 10 minutes, and then we're going to come back for some discussion uh, before we finish at eight o'clock. So um, please um, stand up and have a stretch um, and we will see you back as soon as we can uh, for some talking. Okay, let's, um, let's move on. Can I ask Sarah and Jill and Jenny to unmute themselves and Natalina, uh, Natalino and Shona also to unmute. Ah, they can't. Okay, I will um, see if I can unmute you. I wonder if that works. Does that work? Yes. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Does that work? Yes. Yeah. Yes, brilliant. So, um, Shona and Natalino, um, as, as very new members of the clinical team at the Tavistock uh, in the in the 
children and families department and in the JIDS department was what, what, what themes or, or, or ideas or practices struck you from what you've heard? Everything. And that, that may sound ridiculous. And I'm, I'm sorry to speak first, Natalino, but I don't think there's anything that was said or spoken about that I didn't connect to in terms of practice or wasn't connecting to current thinking either inside or outside and, and that's a, a really um, I think a really relevant consideration for the area that I work in in JIDS given socio-political context and I'll, I'll stretch Jenny's homophobia and say that the people I meet daily experience huge amounts of transphobic abuse um, it's also the recognition and I'll connect to something that was said earlier how come three white women are speaking and you very kindly and generously said because you're a lie but I can't help but notice that the two latest people to have been <laughs> recruited by the tabby are also white so I think that there's thoughts going on in my mind around that but I'll let Natalino speak because I've just gone too much I'm not at all um I guess we were thinking about patterns that connect, and, and, and I, was, I was starting to think about, you know, how the stories, uh, the practice, and the personal stories that we heard sort of uh, seem to connect as well in terms of their commitment, in terms of being resilient to sort of reach out and um, sort of. Your sound is a little. Um... On and off, Natalino. Oh, Can you say that again? Yes. Should I, I start from? Fine, that's fine. Okay, I do apologise. It's, it's probably to do with my internet connection. Um, I was thinking about patterns that connect the stories that we've heard for, from, you know, Sarah, Jill, and Jenny, and and uh, I couldn't help to notice really the. The sort of commitment uh, and and the willingness to reach out and to sort of um, <clears throat> um, transparently talk about themselves and and you know and how their journey have have been working with the community and at the Tarby and outside as well and that was really striking um, for me in terms of uh, also how uh, we thought about certain issues and how really the way that we continue to think about certain things at the study, which is at the forefront really of um, how we approach certain situations. I felt a bit jealous actually, but then one mind, I will admit the gorgeous line that, um, and I scribbled it down, I'm so sorry, I bet I won't be able to find it quickly, but the idea is that, that we were doing it before we theorized it from Jill. And I was thinking, is there space to still be doing this? <laughs> because <laughs> these ideas are so relevant. I have the privilege of being a, a tutor and a systemic social work agency outside as well and, and um, did some external marking recently. And one of the greatest privileges I think is when you mark the work of someone who is meeting the idea, for example, of structural family therapy for the first time and writing about it and being able to think about their critique the, the ideas remain really relevant so being able to move the debate about relevance into each different context just feels really live and, and where can we find space to still be creative and, and are we still making it up before theorizing it I'd like to think so. I'd like to think that, you know, with, with everything being relational and moving and growing, we're not in a space where this is how we do this. We're not manualized. No, so it was just a, another thought that struck me. Mm. Um, I'm starting to see some hands coming up from the audience. So um, I'm going to open the floor. Uh, Wilma, you have your hand up. Would you like to ask a question or make a comment? Yes, I mean, just many thanks. I feel very moved and very inspired as well at the same time. But um, just to introduce a word because it's about the outside and the inside and the word is austerity. 
and 10 years of austerity that seem to, in a way, all the indications are that will continue and what that does to our work. Um, I work for Easington um, CAMS and we see the impact of that together with COVID. And finally, yes, a little bit of envy, you know, when the three lovely ladies talk about their past and, you know, a time where you could work and you had time and space to create theories and work together. And being a senior systemic psychotherapist now in a CAMS <laughs> service, it's anything but that space, really. Just to make that comment. But thank you very much. Um, other questions that well, I've got eight screens of um, people in front of me. So um, if I'm missing you or not noticing your hand, please unmute yourself and, and shout out. While I'm waiting for people, I was thinking about the fluidity of, of being able to move from clinical work to research, to theorizing, to working collaboratively, to live supervising. And um, that for me feels like something that we need to be fighting very hard as a, as a profession and as systemic practitioners to, to hold on to, because I think what Sarah and Jill and Jenny have shown is the importance of doing all those things as well as looking in to ourselves reflexively. Jill. Well, I think it's terribly important to, to remember that you can start small. I mean, the anxiety about, you know, doing these things is that one always is faced with epidemiological cohorts of, you know, X thousand people. I mean, I thought the MSC particularly provided an opportunity for small scale research. And I think one of the joys of doing the clinical work alongside researching the clinical work is that it, it creates ideas both ways. I don't know, I'm sure Jenny and Sarah have found this, you know, a piece of practice informs your idea about what might be the next question you want to look at. And when we did the Step Family research, which was the first solid piece I did with um, Gwyn, um, we, had, we did have a questionnaire and it was an incredibly thoroughly worked up questionnaire with all sorts of people consulting to it. But after a while, it wasn't the questionnaire that mattered, it was that you had the ideas already in your mind, so you could inquire about those areas. And I think that informs therapy. Let's have some more comments or, or questions or reflections. Uh, Nancy, you've raised your hand. Would you like to um, switch your mic on and, and say something? Uh, I, I need to unmute you. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, yes, and just thank you to all the speakers. It's, it's just been really inspiring. And um, I particularly enjoyed the um, hearing stories from the, the practice in the GP surgery. I just found that incredible. And, um, and yeah, just, just, just so, so important. Um, I'm, I'm kind of early on in my um, kind of family therapy work and it's really important. I'm currently in an adult mental health context and um, really kind of feeling more and more passionate about bringing that work into, and I'm in a secondary care service and it's, but it's quite challenging. There really aren't uh, in my, I'm in Camden Islington Trust and there aren't, um, I think maybe there's like two people in the trust doing, it. so so it's a bit harder. I think there, there are many more therapists in, in you know, children and families in camp settings. So um, I was all really curious about uh, what Jill was saying about working in homes. Uh, because this is something, you know, and, and, and there are a lot of conversations in my team now about accessibility of the service, particularly for people with really complex mental health needs and obviously in complex systems and how they're accessing it. And I think this pandemic has given us, you know, opportunities to look at other ways of reaching people. But 
I am really keen to kind of think about working in homes, but I there's there's some kind of resistance and some worry about that, which is understandable. But I don't know if you might be able to, to talk about that a little bit and, and just sort of navigating some of those those concerns and some of the resistance that I, I'm noticing about doing this like systemic work in, in people's homes and families' homes. Yeah, I'm happy to say something, but Jenny and Sara, who might want to say something about it. Shall I go? Sara, you must have done this too. You, I'll, I'll start. So I started working in homes when I worked with children in Islington Children's Department in 1966. And um, it's been the most sort of liberating series of moves to have available because if I jumped to 2000, I started working with a family court and I did a lot of my work in people's homes and I felt the freedom to be in the home and yet set a boundary around the interview. Um, I suppose my advice would be you need to be clear about why you're going into the home and if you're going into the home you need to embrace everybody in the idea you can't just go in you know if one person's against it so you have to think quite carefully about setting your setting your seat and what the purpose of the visit is for you and as you see it for the family but i'd be happy to think about it more with you if you want to we we can I say we did it a lot in the fostering adoption team because um, the team I managed at the Tavistock was fostering adoption and um, quite often children who are looked after and adopted um, have been pathologized and othered a lot in their lives and coming into the clinic was absolutely terrifying um, and it meant to them being taken away so we would um, often do home visits or meet in schools which were familiar in order to help them come into the clinic. I think as Jill says, it's, it's, you have to think about why you're doing it. But I think for some children and families starting to work, uh, uh, warming the context, if you like, in the home or in the school can then help people come into a clinic in a way that they can't. Mm. And in general practice, certainly in, um, in, in, in Sheffield, we did quite a few home visits with people that, um, found a struggle to get into the surgery but it takes time and it's difficult and once you start you know you can, it's quite sometimes difficult to stop it becomes a bit of a pattern and um, there's a, a question I, I think we've got time for one final question Julia you've raised a question in the chat would you like to speak to it uh, scrolling through screens um, just in case Julia can't do that um, Julia's question was about um, well the comment was about the the creativity and, and um, of the of the presentations um, and she was asking about um, the fluidity of boundaries between therapy and clients especially in this COVID time and how that changes relationships um, also how early gender ethnicity and so on was being thought about and have we come very far and have we not come very far? Um. So I say something about um, about COVID and I am aware of time and I don't know how particularly you're going to be, but the the um, I do think it's it's been a very interesting, and you know, what we haven't talked about this evening has been about the shift online work. And I mean, some people and those who aren't working online have been working face to face, but yet have carried the anxiety about, you know, Am I going to be the weakest link in my family? Am I going to be the one to, to bring it in? But I think that um, um, in addition to the kind of issues that, that I was raising before, I think there, in some situations there has been more of an, um, um, I don't know how to say, sort of something of a it's sort of a less formal um, kind of setting. You know, if you're seeing someone where you're actually looking into their living room, it's a different kind of context. Um, and in fact, I remember going on a training on online work in the early days and somebody saying, you know, that they'd had to, um, they'd actually, actually asked somebody to put on a shirt because of that sense of disinhibition. I think it has made, um, it has made, um, or speak for myself, um, there is a bit more of an informality, but I think, um, I think there's, it also connects with the side that we, 
to some extent, we're, we're in this together, even though our experiences might be very different and needing to, to watch the boundary in some kind of way. But um, I think it's a very, very interesting issue. And it, it touches on the comment that was made before about um, theory and um, practice and theory, um, because I think perhaps we're always in the process of, um, of constructing theories, you know, the textbooks on HIV AIDS, working with HIV AIDS, were not written at the time when HIV AIDS exploded. Likewise, the textbooks on COVID, they can be written later. So there was always that, of course, there's something hugely Im important about respecting the body of knowledge that's come, come down in terms of our theory. But I think there is something about, you know, how it relates to our current context. And we will always be faced with situations which are different. Um, yeah, I mean, in gender, I know that Barbara and I were working with it a lot in our uh, work with illness, but others were much earlier. So um, I guess, Jill, you, you, I know that um, Charlotte Burke and Gwen Daniels were doing a lot of the work in this area. But that's when, for many. That's when you were there. Yeah. That's when you were already at the clinic. Yeah, yeah. So did you see it happening in vivo or was it a theory? Well, I know that we addressed it in our work. You know, things, something that comes to mind is somebody just saying a, a, a wife of a man with cancer talking about when he was much better, we're in no man's land and just saying, do you mean no man's land or do you mean also no woman's land? And likewise, the assumptions um, that at that stage and it's shifted now, but when it came to renal dialysis, the assumption was made that the mother would go in um, um, to do the dialysis um, and opening up the question because that wasn't always what the family wanted. But I think we were starting to have conversations. Yeah, but I imagine it was well before. I am very, very reluctantly going to draw this to a close because we are past the time boundary. Um, thank you so much, Sarah, Jill and Jenny. It's been a really, really moving and wonderful couple of hours. The recording will be available um, and the slides will be attached to the recording. Um, we have other systemic events happening throughout the year. There's, there's a video um, we, uh, that, that uh, Charlotte Burke is making that will be shown uh, in the autumn and there are other talks that are happening as well. I hope to see many of you at those talks and thank you very much for coming this evening. Bye everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.